The lighting on this video is deliberately terrible. I've got the sun shining on my face, but that's the end of my journey. That's today. That's January 16th, 2024. Let me explain how I got here. So I was lucky enough to attend a workshop over the weekend with two incredible people, a fantastic business strategist called Daniel Priestley, who wrote Key Person of Influence, an incredible coach called Rich Litvin. And they were in an exercise about owning your past and owning the journey that you've been on. And it was eye-opening for me because I'm a modest Brit. You know, we don't like to big ourselves up. In fact, most of us humans don't like to do that, right? Throughout human history, we've been, you're always punished for being the one that stood out, the one that said and gave their point of view. It was much more of a survival technique to keep your head down and just go with the masses. So this feels like a brave step for me to share this video with you, but I want to do this. Let me share my journey. I studied neuroscience at university, 1995 to 1998. Still to this day, can't quite fathom why I chose to study that because I've been really into computers before, you know, had computers since I was younger. I chose not to do computing. I chose to do neuroscience, which was a real push for me. It was really tough, a really difficult course. I didn't do so great on it. I think one of my professors saw something in me anyway and tried to push me forward to do a PhD at that point. Not for me. I didn't get a great grade, but it clearly stuck with me because it's one of the things that I touch upon throughout my career is that neuroscience course. At the time, it didn't feel right. Looking back on it, it did. My learning from that is I was bold and I pushed myself forward. From that, similarly, I didn't want to work in neuroscience. I didn't know what else to do. I retrained as a teacher. I thought I'll go and see a bit of the world and do it as a teacher. So I did. And now I'm an introvert at heart. You may not believe that from this video, but really I am. I don't like to be at the front in terms of the crowd. You'll find me in gatherings at the back with maybe one or two people having a great in-depth, in intimate chat. It's a push for me to get on the stage. It's a push for me to do this. But what I've learned from my past and what I learned from teaching is that you, you have to put yourself out there. It's something you need to do as a human. You need to be out there. And I learned that the very first day I was teaching children. I taught children, mostly under 10s. The very first day I went in expecting of my teaching career, when I had my first job, I went expecting one class of seven, eight year olds. I ended up with a class of 14 and 15 year olds. Wow. I'd not prepared anything in terms of the right material. I'd not really taught teenagers before. It was a scary experience for me, but I survived. Part of the reason I'm known as Mr. Joe now is a hark back to my teaching experience, really. It was really something that stayed with me. Being put into difficult circumstances, not through my own choice. I mean, certainly I chose that career, don't get me wrong, but because I was working with children and children are wonderfully and utterly unpredictable all of the time. You cannot control kids. You cannot expect there to be a level of control in terms of what you do with children. There'll always be the unexpected. And it taught me in terms of teaching to give up that level of control. I can't have control, right? Control is something that's nebulous. And we all want, but it's almost impossible to get. And actually, it can be, feel quite comfortable to be in that place of no control. I went from teaching. I went back to university again. I studied at the University of, of, of Bath. I studied human um, communication and computing. It's an amalgamation of psychology and computer science, the two of them together, to create my next career, which was user experience, how people use technology to communicate with each other and how technology gets in the way of simple human interaction. Wonderful career for me. Um, I went from that into then the world of work around that, and I was lucky enough to meet. Uh, fairly early on in my career, be introduced to the folks at Marriott Hotels. Um, and they presented a really interesting problem, which was their success rate in the UK was, was about half their US success rate, right? They were losing millions every day or every year because they couldn't get the UK site to be successful. I took one look at it. It was obvious, right? The website was pictures of red buses, policemen in policemen helmets, post boxes, black cabs. It was stereotypically what an international person might think the UK audience are and what they would want. Of course, it was not right. I did some very simple user research, proved it wrong, proved what we had to do and got some incredible success for early on, you know, with sort of hundreds of thousands of pounds of extra success that first year. And that taught me an important lesson, right? That I don't have the answers, that I have an instinct when something's wrong, but I don't have the answers about making it right. I'm not attached to a truth in that situation. And the research opened my eyes to that being unattached from being right and being unattached from what the right thing is to do, but having the means, the processes, the approach to uncover what 
that organization, that business, that individual needs to do. And again, that's stayed with me in my coaching now. I can tell my clients what to do. I give them the processes to help them find the right thing to do for themselves. A real eye opener, that experience. And it also showed me at the levels that I could operate. So that UK experience then led to doing the same thing in um, the Middle East, in Arabic speaking countries, in Russia, in China, in Japan. Marriott pointed me and my team at the right, at these international sites, and we went and we fixed them. And we had millions and millions of dollars of extra success. I mean, if I think about the Arabic website for number one, it was an extra 20 million that first year. I mean, incredible amounts of success. I took that same experience then to the likes of the UK train ticketing system, train line, Disney, eBay, and I had wonderful success doing exactly the same thing, right? Helping people uncover truth. And I was never scared of doing that, uncovering truth, holding a mirror up to that organization to say, hey, this is you. You need to do something about this because your customers don't like it. What can we do? And again, that stayed with me. In 2015, I went independent, which at the time felt like a brave, bold step. In reality, it was a fantastic choice for me because it gave me the freedom to explore and follow my nose, to explore interesting things. Around that same time in 2015, I moved away from design and research into product management. I started working with Mind the Product, the world's largest product management organization. They put me on stage at their conference at the Barbican. I had an incredible time. Around that same time, I was spending 50% of my time working for big enterprise organizations. I redesigned um, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York City, incredible project to work on, helped them reduce the lines outside, all kinds of incredible metrics that we worked on as part of that project. And I also started working with startups at that point, you know, the energy and the speed that startups worked at. The thing I noticed about working with startups is often they were, they had a strong vision, but they didn't quite know the route to get there. And I helped them uncover that route, help them with a map to the future. And again, through simple research, process and approach. Real eye-opener for me. About the same time, I created my own startup. And we had a level of success that perhaps, I, well, certainly, I certainly wasn't prepared for. Uh, me and my three co-founders, we all had young kids at the time. And we were designing an app to help busy parents plan and structure their lives around their family and around their work, you know, bringing those two things together, a blend of home and work together. Another tenant of a lot of the stuff that I do now is thinking about life not being a balance or a conflict between home and work, but actually it's a blend. And when it's a blend, it's wonderful. And that was the app that I was creating. Ironically, in my own personal life, there was no blend there. Like I said, my daughter was two. In the background to all of the work I'd be doing at Marriott and being independent, I'd also had a very successful speaking career. I was pretty much a professional speaker at that point. I'd written a book. I'd had a huge amount of success in terms of putting myself out there and generating fantastic work with fantastic clients. Again, I belittle that stuff a little bit. I didn't even mention it till now. Oh yeah, by the way, I was a professional speaker and a professional author. Again, for me at the time, it didn't feel like an important step. It just felt like somebody was pushing me into outside of my comfort zone by asking me to be on stage, by asking me to write a book. In retrospect, of course it was a fantastic move, but it felt very difficult and hard and felt like a real emotional push for me to do that. But I did it and it was fine and it pushed me forward in my career. I mean, it was frightening, don't get me wrong, but it did an incredible, it was an incredible insight into myself about what my motivations were. Of course, my teaching came back to me when I was on stage. It really helped me to feel comfortable up there in front of 2,000 people. And to understand that I was not in control of that. I was not in control of the people's emotions in front of me. All I could do was go up, be up there and put on a great show, which I lovely and I, which was lovely. And I really enjoyed something I love to do is to put on a show. Anyway, back to my startup. We were looking for 1.2 million in seed money and we were very close to doing that. But at the same time, my life was falling apart behind me. I was traveling all the time. My wife's health was getting worse and worse because again, she was solo parenting effectively with a challenging young daughter. Um, and her health was getting worse and worse. And I was just ignoring it, right? No, my career is the most important thing. As long as the mortgage is paid and we've got money in the bank, everything else is fine. Of course, that's not the case, right? My life was falling apart. I was on the cusp of enormous success with this startup. You know, the, it was a billion dollar opportunity and we were having a real, real success with VCs at that point. We were getting some real momentum behind us. But it felt like a time to change for me. I couldn't carry on. So much so, I don't think I really noticed it. I was that, that metaphorical frog in the boiling water. My life was literally on fire and I just didn't see it. I was just focusing on this big goal of being a billionaire, right? As soon as I've got the money, everything will be fine. As soon as we're rich and we're in every, there's money in the bank, I can sort everything else out. I mean, we all know, of course, that's not 
a sustainable approach. It didn't work for me at the time and it doesn't work with any of the billionaires that I work with now, right? Money, of course, doesn't make you happy, but still we have that belief that money gives us comfort, security, control, all of these things. The reality is, is those, not, those are not the things that make us happy. My wife was smart enough to realize that in me. She gave me an ultimatum, right? Startup or marriage. Of course, I chose marriage. My CEO at the time, Lisa, noticed this in me as well and said, you know, look, you're not happy. Do you really want to be on this journey? And she forced me to make a choice, right? And I'm pleased that she did. Lockdown happened. Everything changed. I went back to square one at that point, right? Back to a career I wasn't enjoying in consulting. But lockdown was great because it meant a reset at home. And I think it was the same for all of us. We all kind of felt that there was a reset from lockdown. I did some consulting. I met some incredible people. I met some CEOs who made some awful decisions. Um, it was a great time for me to, un to have not have the pressure of what I should do next, but just to enjoy what I was doing. And I did. I had a wonderful time at home. My wife was starting to get better. And then we made a big, bold choice to move to the sun. Um, October 2021, we came and visited the South Coast in Dorset, where I am now. We fell in love with the place. We fell in love with the house. We moved pretty much immediately without really putting too much thought into what what it was going to be like. But instinctively, we knew we had to do it, right? We had to get out of the city we were in. The schools weren't great. All of these things that were in, you know, in your mind as a human being. And my wife's health was also awful. And we wanted to go somewhere. In that classic Victorian way of taking the sea air. And so we, did. we moved down here to Bridport in Dorset. I live by the sea. I've got a beautiful view. Sun's shining on my face right now. It's an incredible place. And around that same time, I had a bit of an insight. I got a coach. I paid my coach and my very first coach, Dr. Aaron Baker. Hello, Dr. Baker. An incredible coach. Um, I paid a lot of money for coaching. Um, I knew that I needed it. And Aaron absolutely understood what I needed. And so I made a huge investment. $35,000 in coaching. And that was really important for me for two things. It was an investment in myself at that point because the last couple of years have really been investing in my family and getting them to a point where they were happy and in a safe place here in Bridport. But I'd not ever invested in me and my business properly, really. I'd kind of followed my nose. I'd not have a, had an intentionality about where I was going to go next, but I knew where I wanted to go. I'd seen these poor decisions that were being made in these large international, multinational businesses, and I didn't want that to happen anymore. I'd seen early stage CEOs with really good heart and great skills flounder. They couldn't cope with being in that top level. So I went into coaching. I started to want to help CEOs. I made that brave step to leap into the unknown of, right, I'm just going to work with CEOs. I'm not going to work with anybody else in the organization. I want to help these people because they have so much influence and power and responsibility and weight on their shoulders to do the right thing for their business and for themselves. And there's nobody really supporting them at that top level. There's nobody holding that mirror up to help. There's nobody there to, for them to say, I I don't really know what I'm doing. And once I'm, I made that unlock in my mind, I was like, well, this is the place I need to be. Everything that had come bef from before fell into place. My psychology, my ability to make big leaps, my ability to not be tied to the right answers, but help with process, approach, skill set and mindset to come up with that person and that business is right idea suddenly all fell into place. And I'm thriving here. OK, I've clearly hit the point where everything's come together for me. And now that's what I do. I coach CEOs of publicly listed multinational companies to help them really get stronger impact in the world. And that's beyond the normal measures of success like share price or shareholder value. This is really that inner human success that they know they want to have. What legacy do they want to have in the world? What do they want to be known for? How do they want journalists to write about them? Most importantly of all, for all of us, what do we want? people to say when we're not in the room about us? What are they saying about us when we're not there? And I'm helping CEOs to project that into the world. I also do a great line of work in helping and supporting first-time CEOs to find their voice, find their skills, get to a point where they are successful really quickly and are really loving and thriving and being happy where they are. And that's the tenet of where I am now, right? The blend of family and work, the blend of the personal and the professional, the blend of shareholder value, monetary success and impact and success in the world. 
all of these things are blended together in the way that I approach and I work with leaders in the world. And I'm so excited about the next few years of my career, more than I've ever been before, because I know what I want to do and I know who I want to do it with. And if that's you, great, fantastic. You know what I'm about. I want to learn about what you're about. Tell me about you. Tell me about your business. Tell me about your career. Tell me about your life. I'd love to see your video back at me. Now, if you want to, you can post that video down below. If you want, you can just send me a link to that video. I want to hear your story. None of us tell our story enough. None of us get heard. Don't worry if it's nothing like mine. There's so much gold in your backstory that you just have to mine for. All right. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the sun. Take care. Bye-bye.